It's now my great pleasure to welcome you, Connie, to the National Energy Efficiency Conference 2020. Thank you very much. Connie, you have long been a champion of energy efficiency, going back to your time as Denmark's Minister for Climate and Energy. Uh, can you tell me about why you regard energy efficiency as so crucial and, and what has been achieved in Denmark since you put energy efficiency firmly on the agenda back in the 2000s? Yeah, but also even before that, you know, back in the 1970s, we had two big oil crises and mm. it really dawned on, on the Danes that, wow, uh, it's really problematic when suddenly Saudi Arabia would not deliver oil to us. Yeah. So there is a tradition that goes way back that uh, to save energy makes a lot of sense. Mm. Then, of course, we also found our own oil in the North Sea. So mm -hmm. for some decades, it was as if, okay, it's fine to save energy, but on the other hand, we were self-sufficient for many years when it comes to energy. It was as if it still makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. to invest in energy efficiency. Also because from the 1990s, when we started to sort of transition into more renewables, people understood that the more you save energy, the less you have to invest in renewables mm. to make the transition. It's absolutely true. Um, and it's a, it's a point that we often make here in Australia is we're effectively um, transitioning the vast bulk of our um, supply side infrastructure um, here in Australia. Many of our coal-fired generators are, are almost end of life um, and, and almost all will need to be replaced with something um, by uh, the end of the, the 2030s. And, and so... Um, in, in the context of, of knowing that we need to make these, these investments, um, managing and, and reducing the amount of capacity we need to replace through sen sensible um, uh, demand side uh, investments, improvements of energy efficiency and energy, energy management is prudent economically. Um, before you even get to all the other multiple benefits of energy efficiency um, in terms of health and, and comfort and, and, and well-being um, uh, that uh, we know um, are well-documented. Connie, um, uh, at the, at this point, so uh, it is the it is the ultimate no brainer. But I'm interested in in, in Denmark's in the context of Denmark. It, it, you can find people around the world that that furiously agree that energy efficiency is a good idea, but they don't necessarily do very much about it. And so, what was it? What was it in the context of Denmark that meant that you know this there, there was the recognition, but also um, that was followed through in terms of action. Like, what was what made what was decisive in that respect? Yeah, as I said, first there was really a situation where you had to do something. It was not something that was nice to have. It was really need to have. So from back in the seventies. So there's also been this tradition, but then because of what happened at that time. We also created a number of industries simply that were specialized in energy efficiency because it was not just the households that would have to save energy. It was very much also uh, the industries. So I would argue that today you can simply see some of the biggest international company brands that, that we have, Danfoss, Grundfos, Rockwool, companies like that, they actually became, I would say, world champions in getting a lot out of, of less. So in, in, in making their production processes more efficient. So, so that has also been a driver that there was this job aspect. Mm. And I mean, it's not just something we claim, we can simply see that it gives a lot of jobs today, for instance, uh, it gives a lot of job in the renovation, in building re renovation, just to take an example. Mm. And, and there it is clear that that's the kind of jobs that cannot be outsourced to, to China or, or elsewhere. So there are, there are really, really many good arguments. Plus there was also this social dimension that uh, energy normally in Denmark uh, has come at a price. It is costly. It's a commodity that you have to pay a price for. So to save it makes a lot of sense also when it comes to the social dimension of mm -hmm. it. So I would say that there's been a whole host of arguments. Does that mean that we were always very perfect? And uh, not at all. Also in some, sometimes uh, some finance ministries or whatever have said, oh, can we wait with that? And maybe that does not pay off that much. But now sort of it's very much back on the agenda. 
And by the way, when I was a minister, and, and uh, I think it, it must be around 10 years or 12 years ago that we made this legislation, where we did something that may sound strange because we um, made it mandatory for the energy companies to save on an annual basis 1.5% of their total energy consumption. Mm. And you would say, well, why would you ask energy companies to do that? But the big idea there was if they really have year by year by year to save energy, what would they do? They would start to invent new business propositions mm. for their big customers in the industry and for households. And that was exactly what happened. So that kind of regulation and policy actually later inspired the EU uh, to put in exactly the same requirements because we can see that simply works. Well, um, your your passion for energy efficiency has has continued through through all of your roles. But I, I note that most recently you've been a member of the IEA's Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. Uh, could you tell uh, our viewers a little bit about um, uh, why the commission? was formed and, and, and some of the key takeouts from that work? Yeah, I think that the, the background for this IEA initiative was exactly the same as, as I just mentioned for the case of Denmark, that hmm. to save an energy, energy efficiency is the first energy source, as it hmm. was uh, called. And, and there again, uh, there are many reasons, and the reasons can slightly differ from country to country. For instance, uh, among the European countries, energy security means a lot uh, because we still have to import a lot of energy from outside. So that is costly, that is one good reason. Then there was a social dimension that we also came up with in, in the commission. And then we also had focus on, on finance and a lot of analytical work was actually done that proved that for each million invested in energy efficiency, it created more jobs than a million spent in so many other fields within the sort of energy spectrum, so to speak. Yep. So energy efficiency as a job driver uh, was sort of core and center in, in, in what we recommended in the commission. And then I would mention one more thing because we also pointed to the fact that there's so much still to be, be done when it comes to, to uh, the digital uh, yeah. coupling the digital development with energy, uh, smart meters, smart grids, there are still a lot of low hanging fruits there where the investments would, would pay off. So again, there was a whole host of recommendations. Uh, also, by the way, that the public sector should lead by example. Mm. I mean, the public sector, I guess that must go for Australia as well. Uh, has a huge say over institutions, schools, hospitals, street lightning, a, a lot of energy consumption there, where if you can both prove that it makes sense in a forward-looking manner, mm -hmm. climate-wise, but also economically, also a lot of co-benefits stem from it, and it drives job creation, then, uh, of course, uh, wh wh why be in doubt that this makes sense? And maybe, look, what was most interesting to many from this uh, International Energy Agency Commission was that there is a, a whole annex, a big annex, where the best practices from all over the world are being communicated. Uh, and that is one of my hobby horses. There's so much good experience out there. Mm -hmm. We are not very good at sharing and building on each other's experience. So uh, actually, Australia is also men mentioned for, for one or two examples there uh, as is New Zealand another one in the, your region but there is a whole host of things where you could really get inspiration as to how to shortcut to better solutions when it mm. comes to energy efficiency. Mm. I, I completely agree and it's one of the things I'm passionate about as as well um, there, there is so much good work happening in the field of energy efficiency right around the world um, and, and as, as as you know Connie it, it's quite a um, a, a, a detailed and, and, and complex policy area because there's different opportunities in barriers in different parts of the economy. And so um, uh, uh, it can for um, uh, policymakers that, that uh, are coming to, to an area for the first time um, seem quite daunting. 
um, to drive change in a space. But the reality is there is, there is a, a voluminous experience from around the world of things that have been tried. Some things have worked, some things haven't worked. And, and one of the things um, that I think is coming on all of us that is pa- passionate about this space is do whatever we can to try and build that connective tissue um, between jurisdictions. And so, as you say, we can learn. And I've been incredibly impressed um, by uh, the role of the International Energy Agency over the last six months in a period of very um, uh, in- intense deliberations from government around how they can harness all kinds of all kinds of uh, uh, methods, including energy efficiency, to restart restart global economies. The IEA has taken on this role almost of a, of a clearinghouse and, and advisor for, for governments around the world, both providing the, the evidence base, but also, you know, um, directly engaging with jurisdictions as they as they think through what's what's possible uh, um, in in the current context. It's been incredibly impressive. Connie, the um, the commission delivered its report in the middle of 2020 in the midst of a global pandemic and one I'm, I'm sure you weren't anticipating when the commission was formed in 2019. Um, how did that um, change the, the reception of the report and the significance of its findings? If anything, then the whole uh, big, big uh, job we have ahead of us in sort of recovering the economy in light of the COVID-19 if anything, that has highlighted even more why it makes sense to invest in energy efficiency. Again, not the least because of the job potential there. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's it's really many skilled and, and uh, non-skilled jobs that can be created there. It's not just something you would postulate, it's something that you can actually prove black on, mm. on, on white. And, and that is why in light of uh, COVID-19, people having come out of, uh, out of jobs, things like that, you need something that can create results r- relatively fast. And you know, it's, it's fine with big energy uh, infrastructure projects, uh, power to X, uh, CCS, all these things that we know of, it's all very, very good and it's all needed, but it does not necessarily create a lot of jobs here and now, whereas renovating our buildings, for instance, that creates jobs in your yep. neighborhoods, in your local communities right now. Mm-hmm. And also we have seen, I mean, our companies, our industries uh, have been strained obviously because of the COVID-19 uh, setback and, 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 and the crisis there. And one of the areas where it pays most off to invest in energy efficiency, that is in uh, industry energy efficiency, going through the whole sort of uh, way you produce the goods. Mm. So again, there is also a very tangible reason why this would make sense even in the aftermath of of the pandemic, because you will have a hard time to find anything else that generates uh, good economic results, uh, long-term climate results and jobs at the same time. Interested in getting into some of the detail of how this uh, this advocacy and and um, information sharing around a, a clean recovery is being translated into action, and I know that you're most familiar with the the situation there there in Europe. Um, obviously, the European Commission have set aside. Um, hundreds of billions of dollars for recovery and a big chunk of that um, is set aside for, 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 for recovery investments that have a climate dividend. But I've noted in some of your commentary that you've expressed concern that, that member states and perhaps need to, need to step up with ambitious plans of their own. So interested in the, in the European context, how you, how you, how you feel um, uh, you're, you're tracking from, from afar in Australia, it seems very impressive um, and, uh, and an order of magnitude greater than anything that we're doing over here. But but um, it, it, it seems like the, the, that you feel, Connie, that, that Europe could pa- perhaps be doing more. I think the recovery package and the whole Green Deal uh, from the European Commission and adopted in principle this summer and in, back in July for, from, from the heads of, of states, that is, that is really, really good. Also because it established a new principle that uh, if you're not just going to talk about a new Green Deal, but actually doing it, then of course, uh, climate, sustainability, it must be sought through all the investments that you you make, all the long-term things and all the long-term decisions, economic decisions you make. So that was why it was really interesting that this 750 billion euros recovery package 
There, it was part of the decision that 38% of all this, more than a third, should go measurable and targeted. It should go to, to promote the, the Green Deal and the climate targets. And for the rest of that enormous pot of money, it was established as a principle that, uh, that, that, they, that must do no harm do no harm for mm. the rest mm. of the mm. money. It mm. could not go sort of the, the wrong way, it could not go backwards. So in principle, this is fantastic. But then of course, uh, the, the big test will be, do the European institutions then have the capacity? Are they strong enough when the member states come with all of their interesting ideas actually to sort of enforce uh, these uh, really excellent principles mm -hmm. and that we still have to see i could still imagine a few member states who think yeah maybe that's not the most important thing uh, but but actually the, the 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 direction that has been set is really really interesting and i actually think that most people in europe see this a uh, new green deal or the green deal of europe as also a way to innovate our industries, uh, to innovate and, and increase our competitiveness, because we really do believe that in the coming years, uh, to be really efficient, not only energy efficient, but resource efficient, yep. that is part of what it means to be competitive in the 21st century. And, and the Green Deal sort of set out the, the direction for that. We've just heard Connie from uh, one of our state ministers, Matt Keane, who is is uh, aggressively sort of painting this picture of the great opportunity that Australia has as potentially a clean energy superpower, um, not just ex in exporting things like green hydrogen, but also you know expanding our manufacturing uh, base um, because of the, the the availability of of cheap. Uh, clean fuel. So that idea of, a, of an opportunity in this space is certainly one that is being uh, prosecuted in some quarters here in Australia. But going back to your point around, you know, the 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 do no harm piece of the stimulus package, um, I remember a conversation I had with um, uh, Dr. Brian Motherway at the International Energy Agency early earlier this year. Um, he said something um, that that uh, I really took to heart, which is that don't just look at um, the the chunk of investments that are going towards um, uh, explicitly green agenda items. Um, have a look at the investments that are going into other places as well, because um, if if there's just as much going towards um, unhelpful areas as there is going to helpful areas, the, the net benefit might not be that great, or you might even be going backwards, even though there's some some green baubles on the side. And it sounds like something that 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 you're encouraging uh, advocates in this space and people with an interest in in making progress as we as we recover to 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 focus on that that the the, the over overarching shape of recovery packages as well as just the green elements. But that is also where what is happening in the um, financing sector is mm. so important. Mm. Uh, you know, in Europe, we had this taxonomy now uh, sort of adopted and that will start to enter into force now so that the financial sector, the pension funds, the institutional investors, uh, what have we, they, they must uh, make it much more transparent. When are they investing green? When are they investing black or traditionally? Mm. So I think that we will, uh, we will see, and we already start seeing investments start shifting track. And mm. that means something because you are of course right that every time we can uh, be happy about something going into the right direction, then we could also you know, make a whole speech about all the things moving in the wrong direction. Mm. But as money makes the world go around, what investors decide to do or not to do and what they are sort of asked through regulation to, to do or to account for or not to account for, that means a lot. And, and we can see now, for instance, in Denmark, pension funds, they now start to, to run big commercials about how green they invest. Uh, their members uh, start really to demand it on the annual uh, General Assembly, things like that. So it has really become a topic. How do I invest my money as a future pensioner? Uh, how does my pension fund, what do they do with my money? Uh, so that is starting to change. For instance, in Denmark, our green transition, it was actually a consortium of pension funds 
that offered uh, the Danish government what adequate 50 billion Australian dollars mm. for investing into the green transition. So I think there we, we really see some of the bigger shifts happening now in, throughout the financing and, and investment community. It almost seems in some ways um, with, with developments like the, the, the Task Force for Climate Related disclosures some of those those frameworks being put put in place that the, the investors are pay, paying more and more attention to that almost um the, the the finance sector is is moving as fast or, or faster than government policy in terms of you know um investors starting to take into account some some of the the climate implications of, of decision making and also climate risk associated with making making investments that are not appropriately cognizant of you know some of the transitions that are working their way through the system um it's accelerated remarkably in the last couple of years connie and my my gut feeling is that it's likely to to continue to accelerate as we move into the 2020s yeah, I guess you're right. Also, just see the, the world's biggest uh, investor like BlackRock mm. is starting to, to, to do that. So it's not just a, a, a European or whatever phenomenon. I think it's, it's more widespread, as mm. you mentioned, the TFCD there. And, and I guess that we also have a chance to see that grow even more now with a Joe Biden presidency, mm. a Joe Biden administration in the U.S., uh, because the tendencies are already there among, for instance, also big financial players in the United States. So yes, I, I, I really do think this is not something that goes away. Uh, actually, I would also uh, say that uh, the Chinese leadership preparing the next five-year plan, yes, again, there you could make another speech about all the coal plants they are still investing in and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. But I really do think that when... Xi Jinping came forward at the opening, his opening speech for this year's General Assembly, UN General Assembly, uh, and announcing that China will be sort of carbon neutral by 2060. And that was an interesting sign that something more fundamentally is, is going on in really, really many quarters around the world. And, and that brings me back to the point that uh, the more you sort of invest in being as efficient as possible, uh, the more you also invest in your own future competitiveness. Because I'm absolutely sure that this is not something that goes away. It's not a trend that goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, also because this is the way we can live uh, more than 10 billion people on, on, on planet Earth. So, so there are really many issues uh, uh, sort of pointing into this direction. And, and I think that more and more have seen we need it for climate reasons. Uh, it makes sense economically, and it also does make a lot of, of social sense and job creating sense. There is a sense of um, of growing momentum at that at that uh, national level. Um, just over the last couple of months, you mentioned China. We've also had the the net zero commitments from Japan and, and South Korea, and of course, um, the incoming Biden administration. Um, unusually, and and really for the first time in a, in a uh, in a US context, a, a presidential candidate that has put climate action front and center of his campaign um, and, you know, and, and has really embraced that idea of, um, of green stimulus being part of uh, the US's economic recovery post COVID-19. Um, now, uh, the Biden administration is going to have some challenges in implementing that agenda, uh, most likely, um, and and we are seeing we are seeing the U.S. Um, uh, ping pong backwards and forwards <laughs> from um, sort of recalcitrance on climate to you know uh, adopting a, a leadership position on, on climate issues. How big an issue is the is the the U.S.'s um, schizophrenia on, on on climate for for global sort of momentum and and, and progress? On, on climate change? Well, honestly, the last four years under the Trump administration, uh, it has been quite challenging uh, to watch because uh, I always said that if Trump was only there for, f only there for, f only for four years, <laughs> uh, we could manage that. Uh, but would he have been uh, re-elected? Uh, it would have been uh, really unbearable because, you know, other parties, including Europe, can push this agenda forward. But we need the United States to sort of play its role internationally. And as you said, it is absolutely true that, uh, as it looks now, Joe Biden will have 
many, many challenges in getting legislation and things like that through the American Congress and through the Senate. Uh, but I think that what he can do is to have a much stronger voice internationally. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we saw it back in 2014. And some of us thought that it took President Obama quite uh, a, a little bit too long time to really get into the international climate fight. But it was also clear that when he actually decided to do so and reached out to the Chinese leadership, Mm. and really engaged and had bilateral meetings at the highest possible level there, then it paved the way for the Paris Agreement. So it means something when the United States president and, and the administration weighs in uh, and, and, and when they don't. And, and we need more to weigh in. So that is why one could hope that United States, Europe, you mentioned South Korea, Japan, um, I think that China would very much like to be part of that dialogue, uh, Canada, Australia, that, that if, if, if a big group of countries actually now said uh, time is running out, uh, why don't we sort of uh, sit together really and try and do something here? I mean, President Trump did not even want G20 to discuss the topic of climate change. Uh, that was an easy place to, to start to allow it to be discussed among the the world's biggest economies, and by that also the world's biggest emitters. So we, we've got all this momentum. Um, we've got the, a, a new raft of commitments emerging, uh, the US uh, rejoining the Paris Agreement, um, uh, and in Europe, um, who, are, who are, uh, an area that is in many ways uh, leading um, both in terms of ambition, but also in terms of some of the detailed policy thinking about how that ambition might be achieved. Um, there are a few of us that are following with some interest to the discussion around a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, because that could have implications uh, uh, in the medium and long term for for economies that uh, that are, are not forward facing in terms of the, in terms of the transition um, what do you think those implications might be and how, how concer concerns should should nations that are that are not um, proactively engaged with the energy transition be ab about the advent of things like carbon border adjustment taxes well, when I was a commissioner, we always said that that was a tool that was in the toolbox. But of mm. course, we hoped that we could have countries, including your own, to sort of go in and make emissions trading schemes. And then mm. in the end, we could link these schemes mm. and we could get a price on carbon. So why does this tool, sort of, why has that come out of the toolbox now? And that's, of course, because Europe has set very, very ambitious uh, targets now and is sort of moving towards this whole great deal because then what has not been a big problem so far, namely the carbon leakage issue, mm -hmm. suddenly it becomes a, a bigger topic in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have to do all these things, we, the European industries and our competitors are not doing it, this is unsustainable in the longer run. So that is why Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President, has announced that next summer the Commission will present something around a border tax adjustment, uh, where you sort of put some kind of tariff on goods uh, that does uh, stem from a country that is not doing its, its fair share uh, pricing uh, carbon. I think that if it's done in the right WTO way and all these things, it, it can maybe make sense, but there is one thing I'm really, really concerned about, and that is if Europe just sort of do it on its own here. I think to link to what I said just before there, I think it's really, really important that key economies would sit together, United States, China, uh, Europe, others, and discuss if we are going to do such a thing like some kind of border tax adjustment. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? Uh, I think it's very, very important that it is a dialogue or at least to try it out with a dialogue first because else it could only deteriorate what is already a difficult trade environment. Uh, so I think it makes a lot of sense to, to have it on the international agenda, but I don't think that one region should say, hey, now we, uh, we just do it at least not without having consulted with the uh, different partners uh, before, because then it could end up in something really, really uh, nasty and complex that could sour the international talks. But, but something has to be done 
because you cannot expect Europe to continue to have this high ambition paving the way for these things and, and then uh, the distance to what others are doing are becoming bigger and bigger. I suppose also, you know, the importance of that dialogue in a in an, a global environment where there has been a um, uh, a propensity to leap towards a trade war <laughs> as, a, as a mechanism for for resolving uh, resolving other concerns. Um, it's a more febrile situation than perhaps it's been in in the past, which underlines the need for, I suppose, you know, uh, sober, sensible engagement, um, bilateral and multilateral engagement around some of these policy mechanisms, so that, you know, ideally. Um, they would be they would be put in, put in place if they if there was decided that there was merit um, um, in a multilateral way. Um, uh, in the absence of that, you really want everyone to understand why you're doing it and the rationale and and you know and and what's trying to be achieved and not be not and not be achieved through that process, right? But actually, I learned uh, because at the OECD uh, roundtable for sustainable development that that I'm chairing, we we have had two roundtables around this uh, border tax adjustment mm. issue. And for both of them, uh, we, we had uh, representatives from the United States, uh, from, from uh, the House of Representatives, hmm. where uh, on the Republican side, I learned that they are actually preparing white papers and what have we on exactly some, something similar to a, a border tax adjustment where they are trying to link climate and trade. Hmm. So I thought that was interesting. During President Trump, uh, the, to, to discuss climate has not really been the... <laughs> Their, their, their thing. Uh, but now if uh, there is sort of after the January 20th that when we see sort of new tunes coming out of Washington, mm -hmm. uh, it seems that even in the Republican parties, parties, some people have prepared something around this climate trade nexus. And that again sort of emphasizes why it would make sense to sit down and, and have a strong dialogue or, uh, about how do we then do it in, in, in practical terms? Connie, uh, one of the uh, developments that, that, uh, in terms of the uh, European stimulus conversation that I've been watching with a lot of interest is the, the concept of the, the renovation wave, um, this idea that we need uh, uh, to um, uh, contemplate a, a massive program of building upgrades over over decades um, to up the renovation rate from from one to two percent um, uh, to meet our, our climate targets. It's something which I think is is a concept which is uh, uh, was generated in Europe, but is is starting to be picked up um, and and championed in other parts of the world. Um, can you? Can you sort of unpack for us how important that that building upgrade program is for Europe meeting its its climate ambitions? It seems to be quite central to the to the planning that's underway right now. Yeah, you're right, and that is again also because uh, renovating buildings create jobs here mm. and now, and we still have uh, millions of unemployed people uh, around Europe. Plus, we also still have in in um, in, in many European countries a situation where the energy efficiency is definitely not very high. There are plenty of low hanging fruits still to, to be had. Uh, also in countries that get most of their energy uh, imported from, from Russia uh, and the Middle East and, and elsewhere. So there are really, really many reasons why this makes sense. Uh, but also uh, we have seen, for instance, in this uh, commission on energy efficiency from the IEA that you referred to uh, earlier on, uh, they said, for instance, that at least 3% uh, annual gain in primary energy consumption would be needed, globally speaking. And there they really referred to the housing and the building sector mm. as a key place uh, to start. So there, there is really a, a strong agenda there. And I know that also in, uh, in, in Brussels, the EU Commission is preparing uh, mandatory uh, percentages for how much of the, the building stock that should be renovated each year. Uh, it's easier said than done. It's not sort of a small thing, but there is a thriving building sector there that can, uh, can actually deliver on that. Uh, plus, as I said, also the, the jobs that goes into this are local plus there are really many co-benefits. For instance, if you talk about social housing, mm. uh, it makes a lot of sense for people living there in these apartments that, uh, for instance, with innovative financing models like ESCOs or uh, other models, 
that somebody comes in there, renovate the buildings, and uh, on the longer term, bring down the energy cost uh, mm. of, of, of living there. So there is also a social component that goes for EU, that goes for UK, that goes for many places where energy poverty is, is, is also a topic. So there are really, really many good reasons why this makes sense. Plus, of course, it sometimes also forces us to, uh, to find new, new, identify new products, new ways of doing things, uh, having a district central heating, you know, a lot of technologies that are being uh, sort of uh, rolled out and that has turned out also to be uh, something that we can export from, from Europe. So also that, of course, contributes to making it a really good business case. So with the, the, all the advocacy, um, all the evidence that's been laid out with, around energy efficiency as a stimulus measure, uh, putting energy efficiency at the heart of the, the, um, uh, the economic recovery post COVID-19, uh, do you feel like, do you feel like um, that message has been heeded? Do you, are you seeing signs that um, you know, the level of, of, of action um, and ambition in recovery plans is, is taking into account the message of the, of the commission and, and indeed of the IEA? Well, I think uh, that there are still some quarters also in Europe where the people would say, uh, well, you should not uh, dictate, regulation should not dictate what we do or what we don't do. Why uh, don't we just let the market decide? And then at the same time, we don't have too high a price on carbon. So, you know, you also need some kind of push there. But I think that if you ask the citizens, what makes sense? Energy efficiency to most people makes a lot of sense. Mm. So in my view, when now we are talking about making this big transition into a low carbon world, and, and it can be really difficult to get your head around, what does that really mean? When it comes to energy efficiency, that makes sense. People can see that makes sense. Intuitively, that makes sense. So I would say that normally also, if you go out in the local municipalities, that is something that the citizens would say, why don't we do that? But for instance, I often hear these stories that then the first thing the citizens would ask is, what about public procurement? What, uh, what is the public institutions doing themselves? If you ask me to renovate my house or if you sort of want to energy label my house before I sell it and things like that, uh, what about the local institutions that, the public, uh, that would be publicly owned? So there is something here for the public sector also to show that it is doing its own homework. It's certainly a message that uh, that we like to champion here in Australia as well. That there is a there is a, a massive role for for government leadership, um, showing how it can be done, which develops uh, the local industry and, and builds out the skills and expertise that can be then then accessed by the private sector as well. Um, the the other thing that I can say. Connie is. I'm, I'm pleased to report that you know different state governments, in particular around Australia, have heeded the call around energy efficiency as a stimulus measure. Um, we have the state of South Australia, which has um, made a, a significant commitment to upgrading its own buildings. Um, and New South Wales is upgrading schools, and in in Victoria. Um, there has been a, a package of almost $800 million, which is incredibly significant in an Australian context um, to upgrade social housing, the, the homes of uh, low income earners, uh, for thermal performance, appliance upgrades um, uh, as an explicit stimulus effort. Um, which is going to be incredibly significant in the in um, in the, the work that needs to be done to restart the Victorian economy, um, and so uh, still a lot to do, um, and and still still opportunities to be had. But um, we're certainly in the process of starting up that jobs machine here in Australia, um, and uh, are looking forward looking forward to seeing some of those programs uh, roll out uh, in 2021. Okay, good luck with that. Thank you. We appreciate that. And thank you so much for joining us for this extended conversation. It's been incredibly helpful um, at the conclusion of the context to stick our head above the parapet and, and, and get a sense of what's happening around the world in the conversation around, around energy efficiency, uh, around uh, climate, um, and the energy transition that is being uh, worked through around the world. If, if there's one thing that, um, 
that I take out of this. It's just how much activity there has and how much cause for optimism there is really, given um, the, the incredible momentum we're seeing in, in multiple parts of, of the globe. And, it, and it's, all, it's all driving in the same direction. And if we can do, Connie, what we were talking about earlier, if we can learn from each other, um, share experiences, and, uh, and, and support each other through this transition. Um, hopefully, we could, hopefully we see that uh, momentum accelerating uh, exponentially over the coming years. So thank you. That, that's what we need. Thank you. 